Wow, he came the first time we called. He did. That's, yes, that's... he did. What the hell? What the hell, Craig? What's up with that? He finally learned we were gunning for his job, I guess. Yeah, Unlike you write it. that down. <laughs> well, I'm glad he showed up on time. Who are you? Who, me? Yeah. I am the Grumpy Dungeon Master J. Uh, well, yeah. and I'm Christopher, the other Grumpy Dungeon Master. That's a weird way to kind of put it, but I'm, sure, I'm whatever. Gl- I'm glad you reminded me. Otherwise, I would have just started going and ignored our names. Yeah, is, you know, professionals, which, man. Professionals. Been doing this for a year now. Come which on. Which is weird because most podcasts, I don't think, actually say who they are after, like, the first episode. But Well, we, we had a number of people say that they that there should be a beginning introduction. So that's why we started doing this. Well, they're wrong. (laughs) Maybe not. Maybe. I don't know. But uh, we take, we take our fans feedback to heart and we try to do things that make, that they enjoy. He does. uh, He does. (laughs) I do. Yeah. (laughs) Cause 'cause I'm working on this project. And I'm just Um, an asshole. So, (laughs) So speaking of fan feedback, um, this weekend we finished up pretty much Act 2 of the Owl campaign. Oh, all right. Uh, Our team was able to go and find the Elder Tree in the forest. They kept calling it the Great Deku Tree. What? The Great Deku Tree from Legend of Zelda's Ocarina of Time. I I never played it. There's a giant tree that talks to you. It goes... (laughs) Is that, exactly, is that exactly yeah. how he sounds? Pretty much. And then you have to read what it says. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. That's how, they did, that's how they did sounds in a Nintendo 64 era. Gotcha. So he's kind of like the uh, teacher from the Charlie Brown. Walt, 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 walt. Yes, ma'am. Walt, 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 walt. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that's also the, the same game that had the, that stupid fairy that popped up, kept popping up and going, hey, listen. Hey, hey, hey listen. listen. Yeah, yeah, that one I'm familiar with. Even though I have never played the game. I'm still familiar with that for many reasons. So I kind of want to write into the campaign that if anyone calls this the, the great elder tree, the great Deku tree, just to strike them down with one D four necrotic damage until they stop saying that every time they say it, just a D four damage. Yep. Your brain hurts. Psychic damage. Next thing you know, somebody just drinks a potion uh, of necrotic resistance just to start spamming that. So they can take a lot more damage worse is if they're a cleric. And then they yeah. just start healing themselves just to be an asshole. So the feedback that I got was actually from my wife who was playing. When they were fought the Great Deku Tree, it was a hard fight for them. Take a D4. You just called it that. Yeah. I, I know. And I was just making sure you're paying attention. Oh, I am. I'm here. We had, I had it kind of like, oh, ha, ha, I didn't see that that third death save failure there why don't you go ahead and roll it i had to do that once and then my wife died again and <laughs> again uh, and one of the pl- one of the one of our viewers uh, used ten thousand channel points to resurrect her ah uh, that was nice of them well she came back later and says i really don't like that it's like oh, i sh- died i should be dead and i'm like yeah i mean on one hand, that that is that is how it would have gone if you know that channel point didn't come through. She's like, I really don't think we should have that. And I'm, yeah, I that's... don't disagree with her because the because the critical and the inspiration and the advantage that's cute. It doesn't really change things at the end of the day, even yeah. though some people have been giving crits to death saves, which is still just still okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking the resurrection is a little too far. Probably it, it's it's trying to find that balancing act, yeah. uh, you know, for where where your players are good and the viewers are good. Um, yeah, the 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 resurrection one, yeah, that's probably a step too far. Maybe I'm so I'm gonna remove it from here on out, and uh, we'll just see yeah. what happens. It won't be too hard. I can easily just turn it off. But it was, it was, I thought about it for a little while and I kind of agreed with her because even if, even if they, so even in the worst case, and I say she had died. Yes. They were going back home. There's still a little bit of a journey to, re- to return home. 
but uh, for all intents and purposes, they were they were getting back home fine. Mm-hmm. And there's a druid in that town that can cast resurrection on her. Resurrection there's, or uh, right, re, uh, reincarnation. Reincarnation on her. And yeah, they'll may come back as something weirder or something different. Uh, I'm going to make a table just for Feywild uh, yeah. reincarnation. I've got one and, for my own world as well. Yeah. And that's probably what would have happened if the, the player didn't do it. Or she would have rolled up a whole new character and she would have gotten rid of the one that she kind of didn't want like, but did, but now doesn't, now did again. I don't know. So we'll see. Um, And that was just kind of weird. It was kind of weird to see that get that direct feedback from a player themselves saying, hey, I don't like this thing. Please remove it, even though it was a straight benefit and kept the character alive. Well, that's it. You need the feedback from your players. Yeah. Truth, truthfully, that's very important. You know, it, it's a it's a group game. You're you're not the only one involved in it, and sometimes you do things. And it, you know, if you play rules as written all the time, you're not ever going to really have to worry about that kind of feedback. Uh, you might still have story feedback, or you know ways of doing things a little better feedback but as far as the yeah. rules feedback you shouldn't have much you in this case were going outside of the rules of that and you know feedback's important in that case because they were in an area too where the the layer effect of the great elder tree was causing them to have disadvantage on their death saving throws ooh yeah that's particularly rough it is particularly rough. I could I don't know if I'm gonna keep that. Uh currently the layer uh the sorry, regional effects, I should say, the regional effects mm. is that once you enter this the heart of this of the forest where they are, where all the corruption's kind of stemming from, essentially the elder tree is sucking the life out of the forest to stay alive. Yeah. Your travel time is doubled. Basically, it's all difficult terrain. Right. And, and weed and grass and everything else growing up. <laughs> yeah. But even if you fly, it's still doubled. <laughs> I don't know how, it just is. <laughs> and and if you do a death saving throw, then it's at disadvantage. That may be a little too harsh as a regional effect, but that's essentially what's happening in that area, is if you're on the ground, it's sucking the life out of you. Yep. Essentially. And I uh, felt like the best the it, best way to do that. And short rests also have uh, a negative bonus to them, but I, I really couldn't figure out what that was yet. It's harsh, but I don't think it's outside the boundaries of uh, of good. Uh, I don't know. I kind of like it, truthfully. Like it definitely is harsh, but if your players don't die, then they don't have to. You know, it's it's a non effect. Um, and yeah. It, at the same time, it does increase the ch- well. It, yeah, they have crit fails with death saves, so it increases the chances of crit failing. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I'm still yeah, I, I I still yeah. am good with it. We I actually I was able to play it through with the party uh, for two sessions, and I was able to play it once today live at one of the local game stores, and it it. Yeah, I think it caused an extra failure here and there, but everyone was picking somebody, everybody up like in a round or two. Right, which is what you're supposed to do, and if you're cognizant of that being an effect, you're going to be really diligent about getting people up quickly. Right. I was thinking something along the lines of when you do a short rest or long rest, you only gain back half your hit points. But That, that, might, be a, that might be a bit too much. That might be a bit too much stacked on top of the double fails. Uh, I, so yeah. I, I got to figure out another, a third regional effect for a giant dead force that's sucking the life out of everything. I mean, oh. may, maybe on a short rest, you know, have, maybe they just get the roll and not their con modifier. Or that's not that's not too, yeah that's that's not too bad. I'll, I'll probably do that. Yeah, I wouldn't do it on long rest. Long rest is really important that they get everything if if at all possible. Well, they need to get to where they are and get in and get out in a day. Well, I'm I'm just saying if it you know, if it ever is an issue, long rest is more important than the short rest. 
they did actually like enter the force and go, yeah, this sucks. Let's go. <laughs> Let's leave, <laughs> do the long rest, and then do this the next day. Uh, and another thing I found out too is that I had increased, I had basically used the awakened tree as the base stats for the elder tree. I gave the elder tree 10,000 hit points. Oh, no, not that. Listen, 10,000 hit points. And I had increased its a chance to hit by two and its damage by two. So I had a plus six on top of the, its normal roll. Well, it rolls a 3d6. Okay. So I was hitting people for like 20 average. <laughs> That's not, and, uh, yeah, that shouldn't be the average. That means you're rolling really good. <laughs> right. So the average of the normal awaken tree is 14. So I add my two to it. Okay. The average is 16, but I was averaging 20, 26, right, and yeah. just blowing them out of the water with this elder tree. Now, the elder tree can't move. Its AC is 10, uh, its dex is like four. Okay. <laughs> And it's, you know, intelligence, uh, constitution, charisma, and wisdom are pretty high. And essentially, you can't beat your way through this tree. It's just a massive tree in the middle of the forest. Yeah. Bigger than gargantuan. And you're just supposed to hit it. If you hit it with fire, um, sorry, if you hit it, if you hit it at all, it has to make a con save for concentration. If you hit it with fire, it has disadvantage on that con save for concentration okay. if it fails five concentration checks the darkness that it's been fighting to push back by you know one by, by one sucking and killing all the trees in the forest overtakes it and kills the tree okay so that's that's the fight you, you get there there's a bunch of vine blights that try to hold you back from hitting the tree you know kind of pull you back pull you away and stuff like that that's what, all they're there for but if you sit there and just start banging on the tree, it's going to make a DC 18 con save every single time it takes damage, up to five failures. Yeah. Shouldn't they be wanting to help save the tree as opposed tree, to allowing the tree, it to die? The tree is evil. It will. It it basically says right from the get-go that it's going to eat the sapling in the center of Glad Sky Roost and absorb its power because the sapling is a greater plant entity than it is and it thinks that combined with that sapling it, it could beat the darkness but the sapling is what protects the glide sky roost and all the people there okay uh on top of that it's already killed half the forest around it and it will just continue going it's the reason the worms even got sent into the village and it openly admits this to the players and then it's like now i'm going to eat you and suck your life essence from you hence the disadvantage on death saving throws right the second you hit the ground it starts warming its way in and trying to eat your life force um nom 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 so i'm swinging this tree branch i'm just doing one attack per turn okay because it's more focused on concentrating and pushing away the darkness than it is attacking the players um and I was just blowing through them with this tree just over and over again. Just like, bam, here's 26. Okay, I'm down. <laughs> bam, here's 26. Okay, are, are I'm they, down. Are they level three? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's that. Uh, uh, yeah, 26 damage. That's going to drop the majority of them. And what essentially you're supposed to just hit it a lot real fast. And, and if you know that's the, the trick, then it, the combat's really, really quick. But they were able to kill it. Uh, I did give it a legendary action to swing another time after somebody, especially if they go after the plant that it has. It has like a little awakened bush that it's also keeping alive. Named Fern. <laughs> it's and, a bush named Fern. Yep. And so it's keeping that alive as well, too. And if you kill that, it does this giant AOE thorn attack that hits everybody. But... Uh, when it dies and when it loses concentration, it basically gets really mad and attacks you with all of its limbs at the same time. Oh, jeez. So there's like 15, 20 limbs and they're all swinging down upon you, but then they stop like one inch away from your body from utterly obliterating you. And then you can kind of see the darkness slowly creeps through his bark, creeps over his eyes and seeps its way through and out of the tree. The tree just shrivels up and dies after that. 
So did any of your players ever kill ferns? Yeah, it's the first thing they did. Of course it is. I, <laughs> I fucking knew it. <sighs> it's the first thing they do. Uh, one of them actually uh, today in the the play test at the store, one guy basically walked up and ready in action to hit the tr- hit the bush, hit the fern, if uh, he thought the tree was hostile. So when the tree went hostile, he's like, "All right, Jose Canseco to the plant," <laughs> <laughs> and well, they were able to kill it too. I need uh, a the the map is really good that we have. I gotta add a lot more to it. Maybe have him like slowly like encase them in vines. So they can't leave or run away. Because that's what happened both times. It's like, yeah, we can just leave, guys. The tree's evil. Let's just leave. <laughs> so. Got I, swear, I swear. At, at some point during Icewind Dale, our players swapped. Like, just <laughs> per, swapped personalities. I swear to God, that's what happened. Because my players used to be the assholes who, who would have killed Fern in a fucking heartbeat. <laughs> and now now I have the feeling that one of them would have carried Fern out of there in a fucking pot and taken it home and watered it. <laughs> Whereas your players decide to you know go all Mark McGuire on the goddamn thing. So funny. I, I don't know what happened, but yeah, our, our player groups have just swapped personalities. So it was very interesting that that happened and all the, the kind of chaos from it. I was able with the on on the stream and kind of go through every single encounter that I planned for act two, except for one. And they're outside that building. So they're going to be experiencing that one soon. And there's uh my favorite one so far was the Etten on the Hill. So thanks again to <laughs> haste for leading me down that, uh, uh, Norwegian fairy tale path. Cause I like really like that encounter with the Etten on the Hill and just doing a bunch of games. Today, uh, we were doing the games, and one of the players like, I want to play him a tic-tac-toe and see who wins. So he draws a tic-tac-toe board, and then the Etten, he, he puts an like X in the corner, and the Etten leans over, and each arm from each head draws a circle on the tic-tac-toe board. <laughs> nice. And he's like, no, 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 you only draw one symbol. It's like, well, there's two of us. There's two heads. Uh huh. He's like, huh. Can't really argue with Annette, and so he calls another player over, and he puts hit. They put they put their heads together, and then they both draw X's to get the get the win in a row. <laughs> I thought that was I thought that was hilarious. Kind of harkens back to uh, Bill and Ted's bogus journey where they play death in board games. They end up beating <laughs> him at Twister and fucking Monopoly and everything else. <laughs> he was, then the guy was trying to basically try to trick the Etten with a riddle, and the riddle is something like. How, do, how does the person in the middle know what hat he has on when he can only see the hat in front of him? The color of the hat is this, and that color of the hat is that. He can only look straight. He can only ask one question. He kept going on for five minutes. It's like, I don't think I explained this right. I was like, the Yetin doesn't care. His answer is that he's going to pick up the person in the front and bite their head and then take their hat. And then he can grab the person behind him without looking behind him, pick them forward, take their hat, and bite their head off. And he's like, and then he'll know what the color of the three hats are. He was like, "Okay, I guess I guess the Etten wins." He's like, "The Etten has a riddle for you now. What's soft like a pillow, but is my, but is the the best weapon against a, a fleshy like yourself?" And everyone kind of looked around at the table, and then my uh, veteran player goes, "A rock." I was like, "Yeah, you're right." <laughs> <laughs> so I I love occasionally playing, you know, very low intelligence NPCs. It can definitely be entertaining. Yeah. I, uh, pr- primarily, I use ogres or every once in a while, like a hill giant or something. I haven't, I've used Ettens, but they're primarily just for combat. I can't say I've ever really gotten to role play one. I didn't, I didn't play him as dumb. I just played him as very bored. <laughs> you know, very bored, kind of childlike, but still absolutely chaotic evil. If they would have done anything to piss it off, it would just want to start smashing people. <laughs> yeah, it's an Etten. I mean, it's giant kin. Yeah. And not not like storm giant kin. It's 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 much more akin to the fucking hill giants. <laughs> or Verbeeg. So I really, I really enjoyed the fact that I got to run all that again the second time and see other people's kind of like normal reactions to it. Yeah. So now I got to start on Act Three and I got to figure all that crap out. Yeah, because I know you're wanting at some point to actually put uh, Glideski Roost 
That's that's the. I'm sorry. That's the only way my brain processes that. It's not Glide Sky. It's Glideski. Uh, <laughs> but I know at some point you're wanting to make that uh, like a real written campaign for sale and stuff, right? Yeah, it, it's yeah. definitely on the way there. Yeah, so uh, getting act- getting play tests with multiple groups is kind of important with that stuff. Yeah. Uh, act three is essentially going to be a large dungeon they're going to have to go through and abandon. Uh, ah, no more flying for you fuckers. Abandon castle essentially. <laughs> you get it's going to be very going to be very interesting to see exactly how I can put it together. I have some requirements and. I have an idea of how it's going to go. It's just, it's going to be a lot to put together. I don't know if I can do, even start it in a week, you know. When it, when uh, do you have to run that? Technically starting next Saturday. I haven't even it's begun boy. to think about it. Mm, um, better get on it. Mm, nah, mm, <laughs> yeah, see, I guess I, I have it kind of lucky because my campaign, it, it is very free form, but I typically will have a week or sometimes two between each session, which gives me time to go walk around and actually think about what am I doing next week? You know, where does this campaign go? Uh, yeah, because like I, I definitely have Act 3, the idea ready, but not what's there. And then for Act 4, I have the vague assumption of what's there, but nothing to paper. But you really, yeah, you really kind of need to get further into Act 3 before you start formulating Act 4. I mean, uh, I know what I want Act Four to be, mm-hmm. uh, and it's actually quite interesting because I, but I have to rewrite a lot of monsters for it. Got it. No. So. Yeah, my my campaign effectively has five acts. My players are still in the first act, although they they actually have managed to get a lot done. This I've run the last two weeks, and not to go into s- stupid amounts of detail, but they're basically trying to start a revolution. Uh, they're trying to overthrow a king, and they weren't sure how to do that. And uh, this past weekend, they they got some information uh, that basically the king is not the actual legitimate king. He has a half brother who is older, and being that it is, uh, you know, it's the classic medieval style of the eldest son is the most important. So they they found out about him this weekend. So now they have to figure out how to get him involved in it. Because he's been in hiding pretty much his entire life. Cool. Yeah. Cool. So they've they've got a list of the nobles that they have to sort of sway to their side. And yeah, we'll see how that ends up for them. But it, it was there was a good thought process. I basically just threw the information in front of them and let them sort of run with it, see what they're gonna do. <laughs> yep. And then the players decide to go completely counterclockwise and See, and that's that's where our players have fucking swapped. <laughs> my old group my old group, and it's the same fucking players, but my old group uh, is how I'm referring to them, they absolutely would have gone off off kilter and yeah, probably ignored the that whole storyline and just decided to try to kill the king themselves. Which you know like that's just sort of how my players used to be, but now they're they're Falling right into the storylines, they're enjoying every yeah. fucking storylines. Now all in a fucking blast with it. <laughs> I think I would really like to actually have a campaign, uh, play in one or run one, but that's pretty much all just lawful good or lawful stupid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my players are definitely not that. Yeah, they yeah. they are they are not lawful by any means. Now, uh, yeah, yeah, like some of them are. I don't. I wouldn't say I have any evil character. Like none of them are playing evil characters, but I would definitely. A couple of them are. I'd put them at true neutral. <laughs> it can go either way some of the time. So I I know you've seen this question already, but I have to ask you live on the podcast. Um, if you multi-class druid and necromancer, you can talk to chairs. That is correct. Cool. Yes, I've seen that. I have no idea if it's true, but in my campaign, no, I'd probably I'm ask, allow it. I'm asking you, yeah. In my campaign setting, I would probably allow it just because it's fucking awesome. Uh, what would be the first question you would ask the chair? Uh, who had the best butt? I would ask him how many times people have farted on him. Uh, yeah, I'd get to that at some point for sure. <laughs> so I do have a, a funny story with what happened 
in the campaign uh, when they were going through um, the forest and everything. Okay. One player, pretty much, it was it was it was the same thought process, but just different spells. So there's an encounter I call the Corpse Forest, and it's essentially you get there and you're in the the dark area where the elder tree is eating all the other trees, and there's just a bunch of corpses everywhere. Now the corpses are nearby trees, and those trees have life on them. I think there's some bloomage to them because the trees themselves are also drawing life force out, and they killed this group of people to get the, their to sustain their life force. Mm-hmm. And it's a bunch a bunch of Eladrin nobles or two Eladrin nobles and their guard, essentially. And there's about twenty bodies, I think, ten, fifteen, twenty bodies. And and the, the encounter is not like an undead encounter or anything, but it's a living weapon encounter. So a halberd, uh, a great axe, four swords, and a tea set, and an armor all come to life and attack the players. Now, they're just animated objects, so they don't really have any intelligence, so they immediately book it to the first thing that they can detect yeah. and start slashing on them in both scenarios what happens is one person is closest and they get dogpiled by all the weapons and stuff okay right makes sense yeah i mean that's that's how it should be my wife decided to cast uh fairy fire on that group of things also getting one of our players in the player who's already getting beat up right and their thought is I'm already granting advantage at all these people. If I get hit by fairy fire, who cares? Right? If every if they already have advantage, uh, okay. Yeah, I could see yeah. that. I, I allow flanking, and he's pretty much surrounded by okay. weapons. Yeah. So they already have advantage on him. So even if he does fail the fairy fire, it's not going to change anything. Yep. Once she casts it, everyone passes except for the armor. <laughs> so only uh... the armor is blowing. Yeah, and so that that sucked, but it was kind of funny. Today, live, one of the players that I have is very, very new. Uh, she's also very young, uh, still in high school. She's the one who casts sleep on the beetle, yeah, not yeah. knowing how big the effect is, and basically put the party and the beetle to sleep. Right. Yeah, <laughs> okay. I, remember, I remember that story from a little while back. This time just shows you how much she's learned. She stood outside the radius of the sleep spell, said, sorry, I'm going to get you with the sleep, but you'll be okay. And she casts sleep on the armor. Oh, no. (laughs) And when she said that, I was like, okay. And then one of the other players, my Dimitri, the the one who's in both both the live session and this one, he kind of looked at me and I said, yeah. He's like, all right. He kind of just just he's just going with it. One of the other guys is like, wait, what did she say? I was like, nothing. You let this happen. <laughs> and then the third one was like, did she? I was like, no. <laughs> this happens. So she cast sleep on the animated armor. She rolled 36 on oh. her thing. It was only enough to get like them, her, the person, the other person that got swarmed, and all the artifacts. So she rolled it up. She's like, okay, what, what gets put to sleep? So I stand up and I point the first flying sword and was like, this is a construct and it's immune to sleep. This is a construct and it's immune to sleep. This is a construct and it's immune to sleep. This is a construct and it's immune to sleep. This is a construct and it's immune to sleep. This is a construct and it's immune to sleep. This is a construct and it's immune to sleep. And this is the cleric who has how many hit points? 17. Okay, yeah. How many hit points do you got? Okay, yeah, you're asleep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> they, I mean, they, that, can't, that could not have gone any other way. I just loved it. It was so good. And I, I love when new players decide to play the most difficult classes. I really do, because it's in those scenarios where you're going to see things like that happen. You know, if that, if if she was playing a fighter, you know, you've only got a couple of things you can do. If you're playing a a ranger, a paladin, like you have severe limitations on on stuff you have access to. But man, you put a wizard or a sorcerer in front of a new player. You know, they read the spells, they're like, this is awesome, but they don't, they haven't played enough to know what monsters can and can't do, what effects they can and can't take. And while their character might know, the player does not know. 
you know, well, the, the best part about this scenario in particular too, is like, I've, I've, I've played with a bunch of new, uh, new players. Yeah. I know but they've all, they've all been, players. yeah, but they've all been like twenties, thirties, forties. Right. A little more experienced. Yeah. Yeah. So they can at least see the spell and understand the more tactical mechanics to it where she's a very young person, brand new to D and D. So it's not quite as thought out as it should be. Right. And that's those, fine. Those, those other people have played enough video games, enough right. Final Fantasy to know that sleep is not going to work on, you know, constructs. So it, it's just, it's like, those are the moments that are perfect for me because I've never experienced that side of DMing for somebody before. And it's really, gl- I'm really glad that I could actually experience it. So, yeah. It may, it may be, it may be embarrassing, but it's the best thing I've ever experienced in D&D in a while. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, that's pretty awesome. You want to know the you want to know the best thing I've experienced in D and D in a while? It fucking happened last night during my game. Uh, yeah. my, my my one of my players, Michael Horn, wanted me to tell this story, so I'm gonna relay it. So years ago, we were I was running the Hobtown campaign, same one I'm running. He was playing the same character that he's playing now, Noodle, who is a he was a gnome back then, gnome wizard. And I don't recall the exact scenario they were in. I think they were just trying to get on top of a building. So one of the fighters decides they're going to just toss Noodle up on top of the building. So he grabs a hold of Noodle and rolls a fucking one on the attack roll to chuck Noodle on top of the building. So I just added Noodle's uh, robe came off and Noodle just hits the side of the building, lands in a puddle. So here he is just running around at that point, no, you know, no clothes on. So fast forward to the campaign I'm currently running. You know, they're now 600 years in the future. Noodle is in a different body. This time, instead of a gnome, he's in a halfling's body. And they were trying to get the drop on a whole bunch of guys in a room. They had sneaked up, they had checked the door, and they see six guys in the room sitting at a table, eating, you know, eating breakfast or whatever it was. So Noodle comes up with the plan of, okay, I'm going to have the fighter chuck me into the room on top of the table, and then I'm going to cast a Thunder Wave, which would have hit all of the guys at the table. That was the plan. That was what they had agreed on. So the fighter grabs Noodle, and I'm, I look at Mike, and I'm like, okay, Mike, do you resist? And he's like, yes. So I have them roll the opposing strength versus athletics acrobatics check. The fighter should have won, but he rolled like a five or something. And Mike rolled an 18 or some crap like that. So Noodle resists getting thrown into the room, despite the fact that it was his plan. So instead, I just had it where his shirt came off, (laughs) just like the previous time. So now he's, you know, the the fighter steps into the room, chucks Noodle in there, gives away the surprise, or tr- attempts to chuck Noodle in there, gives away the surprise. Then Noodle's turn pops up. I still allowed the surprise round since all of the players were ahead of, you know, they were aware of what was going on. So the fighter's turn is completely fucking wasted because he was trying to do this. Then Noodle's turn rolls around. Noodle just runs in there, athletics checks, jumps on top of the table, and thunder waves everybody. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the look on on our fighter's face the the player drew oh my lord just the look of disappointment the fact that they had this plan all set out and then noodle noodle who is chaos incarnate let me tell you it's it's always that way with him just sort of shits on everything <laughs> i'm going to ruin this for everybody yeah, pretty much. All right, guys, I got this great fucking plan. This is what we're going to do. You, you're going to grab me. You're going to chuck me into the room on top of the table. I'm going to land, and then I'm going to cast Thunder Wave, knocking all these guys stupid. Biggity bam, we win. <laughs> and then nope, and <laughs> just fucking nope. So that's that's my favorite thing that's happening in my campaign lately. <laughs> Like, everybody, everybody except for Drew was just fucking dying laughing for about ten straight minutes at that shit. Maybe, maybe we need to trade players for like a, like a month or so. 
you can meet with him in person. Use the drive. <laughs> you had to fly everybody yeah. together down to Alabama. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All of your players have to come to Alabama, and I. Uh, yeah. And then I'll. Uh, uh, however, we'll we'll figure it out. Somebody has to make a road trip, a long one. <laughs> a lot of people yeah. do. So, uh, one other thing I want to talk about this weekend was something that happened to me when I was playing Star Wars. Okay. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. We did want to talk about this. I remember. I mentioned to you after after it happened. So I'm I'm playing a Star Wars 5e campaign, and I'm playing a rogue, and uh, this kind of goes around to like you know I, I expect players to kind of like just go with it when I make mistakes sometimes, and not make a big deal out of it. So like I was actually playing when I was DMing my campaign. I had the druids I had these dryads charm the party. And I had them roll charisma saves instead of wisdom saves. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, I remember that. And they were like, no, no, it's wisdom saves. I was like, no, it's charisma. And then I looked up, I was like, you're right, it is wisdom. All right, it we'll make a charisma fun. save. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, aren't you going to, ch-? no, I'm going to double down on this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the DM, goddammit. <laughs> so I'm playing a Star Wars campaign, and uh, my player gets hit by a ready to action. Uh, when I'm running through your character. Yeah. My character is, I get hit by a ready to action when I'm running through the room and the DM has that ready to action to have the attack happen. And then the extra attacks that they normally would have on their turn happen as well too, which is incorrect. uh, Yeah. I think it's incorrect. Uh, it it, 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 it absolutely, it absolutely is incorrect. Okay. Well, if you, if you hold your action, uh, to attack somebody coming through a doorway, and then they move into your threat range, you get one swing. That that is the penalty for holding your action. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I kind of like, are you sure? And he's like, yep. I'm like, all right. You know, I'm not going to argue with the DM. If that's yeah. What he wants I mean, to I would, I would, I would have told him, and if he insisted, then I'm like, okay. So then I run to where I was going to run because my plan wasn't changing. My character is very rage based, so when she's focused on killing something, she's gonna go kill that thing. So she goes kills that thing. That thing is next. I just shot her, but you know she's gonna kill the one she wanted to kill. Yeah. Then I kill the thing I wanted to kill, and then it's the monster's turn. And these two assassin droids basically come to where my character is, flank me, and then all attack me at the exact same time, which also isn't what's supposed to happen. Even if a group of monsters is moving on turn, the one that gets there first and does their attack first in order yeah, you does have, that you first. Have, you have to roll them in order because players can have reactions and do things that yeah. can make differences. Like, every, every attack has to be separate. So, I was like, are, are, are you sure? He's like, yeah. They all happen at the same time. That's just how I do it. I'm like, okay. Now, what I didn't mention before is that ready to action and the extra attack that happened from it, that extra attack crit me. I took 74 damage from that attack. Yeah. Mind you, you guys, you're, life. you guys are 15th level. Yeah. Yeah. That was half my hit point pool. So when these assassin droids who are assassin monks, essentially, or rogue monks, essentially, they start hitting me. They did something like the first robot did something like 120 damage to me. And the other one did another like 120 damage to me. Well, I only had 74 more hit points. Yeah. But the problem was, is because they all hit me at the exact same time after the first three hits, I had gone unconscious. But before my body could hit the floor, I had another three hits come in. And they were all critical hits because I was unconscious. That's yeah. Standing. So I straight up died. And I was like, that sucks. But. It, it kind of missed me, but whatever. I, was, I wasn't going to make a big deal about it. I'm not going to complain about it because, you know, whatever. Yep. I mean, I, we're level as, 15. There's yeah. thousands of ways of bringing someone back from the dead at level 15. It's yep. not going to be an issue. You can stick me in a back to tank, clone me. We're in a cybernetic facility. You could shove one of those cyborg hearts in me and bring me back to life. A hundred ways, a hundred cool ways of doing bringing me back from the dead at level 15. So 
I think they're just. I think our little tech droid was going to come over and just cast resurrection on me, <laughs> you know. Or the Star Wars equivalent. The the, the Star the fucking, Wars equivalent. Yeah, like the you know pulls out a def- defibrillator. No, 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 no. So what pissed me off was how they resurrected me, because mm-hmm. in Star Wars, you can go down to your local item shop, spend like a thousand gold, essentially, to buy a defibrillator. To bring someone back to life mid combat as an action. Yeah. And that's what annoyed me because the not healer walked over, defibbed me. Somehow the 17 holes that are in my chest just magically aren't there anymore via the zappy zap of a defibrillator. That's not how defibrillators work. No, not even remotely. And, and somehow I'm back at one hit point. Now, I knew they would bring me back, but fuck that item. <laughs> yeah, like that's it's, su- item. it's super anticlimactic. And truthfully, like the, the things you mentioned, sticking a cyborg heart in you, cloning you, things like that. Those are very, very Star Wars. Those make sense. But just defibrillate you know hitting you with a defib or whatever the fuck they call it and all of your wounds are now patched up it it takes away a lot of what star wars is it's one thing to do resurrection or raise dead in dungeons and dragons because it's magic it makes sense you know you can easily just go with it but star wars is not that uh, i could see maybe using the force to resurrect somebody to revive somebody but yeah just items as that it doesn't. It doesn't work with the setting, man. Yeah, and there's. I mean, this Star Wars game. You can go to Star. I think it's sw5e.com, and you can see all yeah. the items and stuff that they have. They're constantly updating that. So if anyone from that group is listening, I don't like that item. That's just too. Uh, it takes away from what Star Wars is. Yeah, it, it really does. And so that that's that's what's kind of annoying me about the whole thing. It's just like. I was like, how? How am I back? With just, I don't want like, to be back from that. Even Dungeons and Dragons doesn't have an item that'll just raise dead. Like, there's no I mean, potion of raise dead in, in 5e. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure as a DM you could just make one, but there's none that are official. Yeah. So, yeah, like that. That just seems op. <laughs> it seems. Yeah. Meh. So, so that actually coupled with my wife saying, hey, I didn't like the resurrection, is actually the why I'm taking away resurrection from the the stream. Yeah. Because I felt like it cheapened her death. Yeah. Just it, like I got my death cheapened. Exactly. So And that thus we come full circle. <laughs> the circle of nerves. The nerves. <laughs> oh god, not nerf again. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. We're not getting on that conversation again. So you can quit actually, D&D again for the thirty-second time. I actually quit. And quick note on that: you saw the uh, the special edition Nerf gun they're making. That is the uh, blaster from oh, Alien. The Ripley right? one. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, that, that one. I, that one. I'm good with. I like that one. That's a good. That's a good one. Yes, it's white and yellow, but you can just get that home and spray paint that thing. <laughs> just shit. Yeah, I may have to buy me one of those. Just keep it in the package and sell it for two hundred dollars in a year. I think it'll go more for two hundred dollars in a year. Probably because the only way to get that is to sign up through Hasbro's like special club membership. Oh, really? Which costs like twenty five dollars a month just to be in to, to have the opportunity to purchase things like that when they come. That's not coming in stores. That's like we're making ten thousand of these. This if you're collect- in the club, you this can collector's market. The the collector's market is just fucking broken right now. It is yeah. so 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 ridiculous. Like I can't even begin to explain. What was the? Uh, oh yeah, the uh, the not the Xanathar's one was it? Or Volos. Yeah. The Volo. Yeah, the Volos guide, the special edition. That it, what it came out three years ago, I think. Yeah. Like if it's selling in pristine, yeah, it's selling for eight hundred, eight hundred plus dollars on fucking eBay. You told me that, and I'm like, eh, you know, I'm sure somebody's asking that. And then I actually went and looked at the sold comps, and no, like that's actually what it fucking goes for. Now I have like the first edition 
reprints that they put out as collector's editions. I have all of those. Mm-hmm. I bought those and those came out. And those were limited time kind of thing. And those aren't even $800. I have no, no idea why that Volos is going for $800 oh, as no, a special it's, edition cover. It's bec- all, of them, all of them are going higher. If you look at the Morton Kanan special edition, if you look at the Xanathar special edition, they're not 800 but they came out a little later. Give them two more years and they might be 800 and that's what that's what drives me insane is I specifically am not buying the collector's edition covers because I don't I want all my books to match on my on my wall. Mm-hmm. And if I had gotten into five E at the start of five E, I, w- I would have been buying the collector's edition. You know, yeah. I bought the Volo one when it came out, but it was fifty bucks. You know, I was I was able I just, to get it for fifty dollars, no which idea. is what yeah. Volos cost. So I was like, sure, I'll take the collector's edition one. Yeah, and that's the thing: the collector's edition one and the non-collector's edition are the exact same price. And mind you, you know, I, I'm irritated now that it's worth so much because I didn't take super good care of mine. It's all scratched up and dings because I've used it. You know, it's I, I've used the book a lot, and now it's you know, mine is probably worth about two hundred dollars when it could be worth a lot more. I'm buying for me for two hundred dollars. <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> you know me. I'll sell it. I'll just go out and buy a regular v- Volos. I don't care. Yeah. Hey. And I'll make $150 in profit. Sounds good to me. I went through and organized all my magic cards, too. And I'm just sitting there and like, I could probably sell this for $1,000, all the rares that I have, just straight up. Yeah, you might but be like, able to. Wh- Why are people buying these things? They're just chunk pieces of, of cardboard and paper. It should uh, be worth as much money. Yeah, it's it. the magic market is... It, the magic market, I understand. It is a proper collector's market. You know, with me having gotten into the eBay sales thing and all this, I'm seeing the collector's market now way more in depth than I did previously. Because the only collector's market I ever paid attention to was Magic. Yeah. And now, like, I I looked up VHS tapes today. There are some VHS tapes that have sold for over ten grand for one fucking VHS tape. Yeah. In the, in the last three months. So I, I just threw away thousands of VHS tapes too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, mind you, they, they are sealed. These have never been opened. You know, so some of them are 30, 40, 30 plus years old, but still it, it, everything nowadays seems to be collectible. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just the way, this is the way things are now, I guess. Yeah. People are, they, they invest their money. Think of it like, you know, gold or anything else. Yeah, yeah, gold or Bitcoin, et cetera. They know these things are going to go up in value, so they can just buy them and sit on them and resell them years later to people who don't ever want to buy it, who who don't ever want to sell them. Yeah. Speaking of speaking of gold, uh, I I had two new people play the game for play the Al campaign, and I kind of mentioned to them that you know gold is worthless here in the Feywild. Mm-hmm. Silver is the only thing that matters, uh, and they're like, oh, okay. So, like, uh, why is gold worthless? It's like, well, there's a city that's just made of gold. So it's pretty much just asphalt to them. And he goes, okay. He's like, I definitely have to work out a trade deal with some of these owl folk where they just want to trade their worthless asphalt for uh, silver. I'll be more than happy to give them a coin for a bar. <laughs> I mean, if you're, I stuck like, in the, if you're stuck in the fade wild forever, then that would be a <laughs> stupid trade. Now, if you're ever able to get out of the fade wild and go back to the mortal realms yeah it might be nice to have well, a little gold well, part of it is is that the that the that glide sky roost is um a travel point a known fixed travel point because of everything that's happening to it mm-hmm. so so, so it's kind yeah of, kind of more like this uh, a smaller version of city of doors I the, guess. Uh, I don't know what uh sigil doors sigil sigil the uh is is glide sky roost a place where you can go from one realm to the next you can go between the material and the Feywild. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's kind. Of, it's like a smaller version of Sigil, the yeah. city, and Sigil, the, the city of doors. And the only reason that it is that way is because people don't want to play owls. And I still want to sell this campaign. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I get it. Look, not everybody wants to play owls. If you were running a uh, Tabaxi only campaign, I would bow right the fuck out. <laughs> I can't play my my chaotic good goblin. 
Well, I only play Chaotic with Goblins. You know, Goblins the Master Race. Yeah, I hope nobody's ever said that. You're right, ev- because everybody knows that Kobolds are the Master Race. No, it's Warforged. Oh, it's definitely Kobolds. It's Warforged. Do we need to the... do we need to compare stats? Sure, let's go. God damn it. I don't have my books in front of me. They're outside. I got it right here. Hold on. All right. Well, you can, yeah, look it up. Read off the Warforged stats and then read no, off the Cobalt I'm, stats. I'm going to read off your dumb Cobalt stats first. Uh, sure. Do it whatever order you want. You're the one who's having to read it, not me. I'm correct. <laughs> cobalt. So the first problem with the Cobalt is, is they start with a K. No one wants to start their racial name with a K. Maybe. So they are small. All right. Uh, well, these these are that's the monster cobalt. Let me get off of that. Yeah, and no, I don't want that one. I want the the one out of uh, the Xanathars, or Volos. What? Yeah, it should be in Volos. Is it in Volos? Yeah, yeah, because that's where all the monster races were at. Were in Volos. That'd be a negative. Oh, they absolutely are. Oh, there in it is. Volos, yeah. Monster lore. No, it's just monster lore. That's where this. That's where all of the monster races are at. That's where the orcs are at. Uh, that's where the. Uh, hob, I think hobgoblins were in it's there. Just, it says character races: Asmir, Furbog, Goliath, Kanku, Lizard. It's Hulk, right Tabaxi, past. It's just Triton, past that. It's monster right behind, adventures. If you go to if you go to Triton, it's right behind Triton. So it's in the monster adventures. Yes. Section. Got cobalt traits. Okay, cobalt traits. Uh, your dexterity score is increased by two. Eh. They reach adulthood at six, can live up to 120 years, but rarely do so. Eh. Uh, are fundamentally selfish, making them evil, but the reliance on strength of the group makes them trend towards law. Is there a lawful evil? Uh, stats, man. Stats. We want stats and abilities. I, I already read the stats. They have I know. Now we plus need abilities. two to dex, period. End of story. I mean, that's pretty good. I'll dark vision. Dark vision, speed of 30 feet. Dark vision, small. how far? 60 feet. Okay. Uh, they are small. And they can grovel, cower, or beg. As an action in your turn, you can cower pathetically to strike nearby foes until the end of your next turn. Your allies gain advantage on attack rolls against enemies within 10 feet of you that can see you. Once you use this trait, you can't use it again unless you finish a short or long rest. Now, probably the best thing they have is pack tactics. Yep. The advantage on attack rolls against creatures of at least one of your allies within five feet of it. And that ally is incapacitated. So, a Cobalt Rogue is pretty hot. That is correct. A Cobalt Not Rogue is lie. the shit. Especially, a, with, especially with Grovel. A Cobalt Rogue is pretty hot. Yeah. Sunlight sensitivity, they have disadvantage on attack rolls and wisdom. And checks the reliant and wisdom checks the reliant sight when the target attack or whatever you're trying to perceive is in direct sunlight. As so you're automatically, going to, as you're going to always have advantage from pack tactics anyway, that's a, you know, negates it. It negates pack tactics quite a bit, yeah. And well, you can I was, speak, no, or or pack tactics negates sunlight sensitivity. It's however you want uh, to look at it. It even however out. you want to look, at it. yeah. However you want to look at it. And language you can speak right, uh, common and draconic. Sound good? Sounds badass right. to me. All right, let's get to the uh, the Warforge traits. All right. Right off the get-go, con score by two, and any other ability score of your choice by one. So already, one more ability point. Who cares about than... that one? Who cares about that extra one? Nobody has odd number stats anyway. Exactly, because you put that extra one in an odd number stat. No, you, nobody, nobody has it. nobody has odd number stats. It happens all the time, especially if you use standard array. Oh, well, who, who the fuck uses standard array? A typical Warforge is between 2 and 30 years old. However, the maximum Warforge lifespan remains a mystery. So far, Warforge have shown no signs of deterioration due to age, and you are immune to magic aging effects. How old does that go? Oh, only 120 years. Oh, so immortal. Oh, 120. And immune to aging effects. 
Huh. Interesting. Yeah, beca because aging effects and age actually matter in a D and D game. Oh wait, no, they that's don't. That's an that's another check towards the Warforged. Alignment. Yeah, we, didn't we guess. have didn't we have the age discussion just last weekend? Yeah, we did. Uh, size, you are medium because medium is better than small. Yeah, if you're going to be grappling, I'll agree with you. If you're not, it makes no difference. Uh, you can set your height and weight between between five foot ten. Um, and minimum is five foot ten, and minimum weight is two hundred seventy pounds. Base walking speed is thirty feet. Now, I will say, as a small creature, the fact that kobolds can go thirty feet is cool. It's a correction uh, when, like, they realized that all of the races should just be able to move at least thirty. Uh, but they, yeah, they never. The first printings and everything, it was like, oh, gnomes and halflings are twenty five. Well, fuck, this sucks. Uh, whenever we do more more small races, give them thirty. So let's start with a list here, because these lists actually need more than just a simple sentence or a small paragraph. These need bullet points to list all the cool stuff a Warforge can do. So let's talk, start with constructed resilience. You were created to have remarkable fortitude, represented by the following benefits, not just one, all of them. You have advantage on saving throws against being poisoned, and you have resistance to poison damage. That's what dwarves have. So there's the dwarf racial right there. You do not need to eat, drink, or breathe. Huh. Isn't that cool? That could be useful. So, no problems with anything underwater. Let's say the wine trap room in uh, Tomb of Annihilation. Yeah, you're even in that effect. There's one trap down that that kobold's just drowning you, in. You want to know the shitty part about that? Hold on. Hold on. I'm not no, doing no, it. No, 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 no. Hold on. The shitty part is you can't get drunk. Contract doesn't need to get drunk. No, it's not. It, 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 it's just not need. It's not need. It's and... just can't. All right, it, I'm sure, I'm, to... I am sure that our buddy the beer bandit would be pissed about that. <laughs> he'll just run the drunk protocol subroutine in his brain, and that's he'll. Just yeah. Oh, okay. Go. Go ahead. Continue. He is immune. Immune to disease. And what the fuck even uses disease in five? A lot of shit. A lot of shit. What? A rat, the, la maybe? The, the last thing on constructed resilience. You do not need to sleep, and magic cannot put you to sleep. That's the oh. elf racial, isn't it? Wait, so two other races and their coolest racial is now just rolled into being a war force. I mean, those race, the the dwarf huh. one, the dwarf one, that's legit. The elf one, meh. Oh, so when your party goes, hey. What's what are we gonna do for uh you know night watch while we sleep? Oh, we don't have to worry about that because our warforged buddy can just stay awake all night and not have any problems. Better hope oh, he has elf good trance? percep. Better hope he has good perception. Dude, he can get he can get like dark vision eyes installed in his brain. Come on. <laughs> Next thing on the on the warforge is the best race ever list. Centuries rest. When you take a lo uh, long rest, you must spend at least six hours in an in inactive motionless state rather than sleeping in a state. You appear inert, but does not render you unconscious. You can see and hear as normal, which is kind of related to why I just set that up above. So I just picture him just standing there with his head just spinning slowly around in a circle. <laughs> <laughs> Integrated protection. Your body has, uh, has built in defensive layers, which can enhance with armor. You gain a plus one bonus to armor class. Straight up. You can don only armor in which you have proficiency. To don armor, you must incorporate it into your body over the course of one hour, doing which you will remain in contact with the armor. To doff armor, you can spend one hour removing it and can rest while donning or doffing armor in this way. I don't really understand it. I, I, if I remember, I actually, there's like... Something, something, he gets plus one AC. There's, and, there's, and there's some Warforged armor. specific armor that kind of turns them into a space marine. Yeah, I remember seeing that. While you live, your armor cannot be removed from your body against your will. I'm pretty sure that nobody can remove armor that somebody's wearing against their will. Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course you can. You can shatter armor and stuff like that. Uh, that's fair. Yeah. Specialized design. You gain one skill proficiency and one tool proficiency of your choice. And then, last but not least, languages you can speak and write, read and write comment in one other language of your choice. So now so, that you now that you have read all of that, do you want to know why the Warforged is not amazing and is not superior? It is superior. Do you want to know why it's not? I. You can try. 
Because it is not official. Yeah, it is. No. What yeah, book it was is. it? They have, what? Whole, they have an entire book where it's in. Uh, that is not one of the official, official, official ones. What book was that? That was... What do they call the... it? I mean, I'm looking in, it up. In, in, in 3 5, they were, that was an official book. Mm-hmm. It is not one of the core official books for 5e. So the fact that it was released as, you know, Eberron 4th edition. Uh, well, um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not talking 4th edition. But yeah, and, and, Eber, then, Eber, and, then, and then released as the Wayfarer's Guide to Eberron in 5th edition. How does it not make it official? See. You, you tell you tell me people can pull Artificer from Eberron and claim that it's official, but they can't pull no, no. Warford? Eber, Eberron actually got reprinted into an official book. Like the, the or, sorry, not Eberron. You, you, uh, you can buy fifth edition Eberron right now. Yeah, I see the book. I'm yeah. aware. It's it's the equivalent of uh what the fuck was the Matt Mercer one? Yeah, I wouldn't put it the Matt Mercer. Wouldn't put it as far as Matt Mercer, but it is in the same yeah, category. Yeah, it, it, it is the equivalent of the Taldore campaign setting. Eh, not really. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. Still, when you compare the Cobalt to the Maddie Magnificence, it is the Terminator. I would play a Cobalt World. long before I'd play a Warforged. And I've played. Oh, I've, I, I've, I, I've, I, now I say that, you know, the funny fucking thing is I've actually played a Warforged, but I've never played a Cobalt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, never, hey. I've never, I've never really had the opportunity to play it. Oh, actually, no, I have played a Cobalt. I played him. It was just a two shot game. Uh, the, the Warforged only got to play for three or four games. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, I had a lot more fun. Well, I, I'm not going to say. I actually enjoyed both. One of them, the Warforged was a wizard only campaign. That was actually kind of entertaining. Uh, but that was also third edition. The Kobold was fifth edition. We were pretty high level, like 15th or 18th or something. So, yeah. I think in, in fourth edition, the Warforged, yeah, they you could you could spec them one of two ways. Fourth edition worked as, as there was a core stat your character always got, in this case, plus two to Constitution. And then there was the other variant that you could pick that you wanted. So if you picked elf, you could do like plus two to wisdom or plus two to dex. Yeah. So if you're going to be a casty or elf, it goes, you go this way, you're going to be a rogue, you go the other way. So for Warforged, you had plus two to strength or plus two to intelligence. Essentially making you a straight Terminator caster or Terminator melee combatant. Right. What about a rogue? Why not dex? Because, much like everywhere else, fighter is the better class <laughs> than rogue. Yeah, I'm I'm still trying <laughs> to get used to that. That's just so fucking weird. Coming from second and third edition, where fighters were the one of the worst classes. Yeah. And now now it's just by far the. Yeah, you don't even have to be a high level fighter. You just need second level fighter. Just just a dab. Just a dab of fighter. That's all you need. The differences were their racials, the Warforged, is they had the living construct stuff where you didn't need to eat, breathe, or sleep. You don't need to make endurance checks to starve, starve thirst, or suffocation. All those effects are, you know, gone. Uh, yeah. They had the same, uns- they called unsleeping water, same thing, but only four hours in this case. Uh, oh, they yeah. had a really, real cool, really cool thing, though, that the 5e doesn't have, which is uh, Warforged Resilience. You have a plus two racial bonus to saving throws against oncoming damage. Also, when you make a death saving throw, you can take the better result of your die roll or 10. Yep. So, so they never die. Yeah. Before, <laughs> before we get out of here, uh, so for anyone who listens who wants to tell me that Warforged are official and all, just hearken back to what we were talking about early, early, early on in this specific podcast where Waples will take your feedback. Me, I don't give a shit. <laughs> They could also heal themselves too once they're bloody. Just bam, more health. Yeah, well, that was fourth edition, and fourth edition, as we all know, was bad. Well, I have, I, I used to use bloodied effects in the fifth edition. Uh, I used the term bloodied for when something hits half. See, and, and people said fourth edition had no lasting impact. Eh, that was the one good thing that I found from it that you told me about. I don't have any of the effects, just the title. You know, I just say, oh, they look bloodied. Yep, means that are half hit points. Yep, I I still have things happen like a 
like a reaction or some kind of triggered effect when they hit half hit points, you know, just just for fun. Right, just like World of Warcraft. What? World of Warcraft. There's a lot of effects that happen at certain health points. What is World of Warcraft? That video game that you spent years of your life playing. No, they had Warcraft 3 and then Blizzard went under as a company. I don't know <laughs> what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's not the case. Let's go play some Overwatch. No. Let's talk about World of Warcraft. You want to talk about that? What's World of Warcraft? Hey, guys. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Check us out on Facebook at... There's no at in Facebook. It's just facebook.com forward slash Grumpy Dungeon Masters. And on Twitter. Uh, that'd be at Grumpy underscore DMs. And on Instagram. At Grumpy Dungeon Masters. And also be sure to follow us on Twitch. Twitch.tv forward slash Grumpy Dungeon Masters, where we play Rhyme of the Frost Maiden every Saturday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Fuck yeah. <laughs>